uh, it's actually warm, it's 40 degrees. Uh, here in Wisconsin, uh, as you know, Matisse and Wicker Lair has offices throughout the country. Um, our satellite office in, in uh, New Orleans has a little bit better weather than we do. Um, we have 485 people in attendance today, which is really outstanding. That includes seven conference rooms, uh, only 68 repeats, according to Jamie, and 106 different companies, vendors, and firms. And I see that some of you have quite a few people attending. And we do appreciate uh, your attending the webinar. And we hope it's informative. I do want to tell you that this is a true introductory webinar. <clears throat> there are many other webinars that we have on our website, uh, including property webinars. If you go to our website and go to um, webinars, you'll see that we have at least a dozen uh, that a little bit more uh, involved investigating and subrogation of large fire losses, although we will talk about that in a superficial way today. Uh, subrogating against God, which is simply a, a how to defeat the act of God defense in natural disasters, understanding the economic loss doctrine, uh, construction defects litigation is another one, landlord-tenant subrogation, product liability from a litigating engineer's perspective, a great, great, great product liability webinar taught by Aaron Plowman, who is one of our senior litigators and is also a licensed engineer. Um, Subrating claims against Asian manufacturers provides the only place in this country where you're, you're going to get a practical approach to suing uh, Asian manufacturers, including Chinese manufacturers, uh, against whom a judgment means absolutely nothing. And we've been very successful. Uh, failure of plastic plumbing products, introduction to cargo segregation. We're, we're going to actually talk about a lot of this today. But I am warning you that it is a very introductory in nature, and we are going to have to move quick. So what I hope to accomplish today is that we ask um, um, some interesting questions. We cover some, some areas that will at least make you aware of the issues. Um, and what we're interested in doing is <clears throat> avoiding the common mistakes that are made in property subrogation. Um, if, you know, work comp subro, for example, I always talk about as being a chess game uh, because of the different laws and how we have to outmaneuver the other player across from us on the chessboard, which is the, the claimant's counsel. Property subrogation is a hockey game. And it really is knock down, drag out, who can check the hardest. There's enforcers, and, and it, it is a rough and tumble sport. But, um, as I've indicated in a number of the articles that we've written, the amount and dollar value of insurance claims relating to property loss alone dwarfs all other lines of insurance. Water losses in the U.S. alone result in over $9 billion annually. Fire losses, $12 billion. Hailstorms, $1 billion. Um, we're talking about a lot of money that dwarfs auto claims and dwarfs a lot of the other lines of insurance. So. This is certainly an area in which we want to um, pay particular attention to to work up. I mean, I'm sorry, to property segregation because there's a lot of money involved. So, a quick overview of property and casualty insurance. I warned you, it's introductory. So, property insurance. What it, what is it? Obviously, it protects against risks to property. You have personal insurance, which is homeowner's insurance, sometimes known as hazard insurance. The ISO has seven, seven standardized homeowner's insurance forms that can be used. Uh, basic form includes uh, insurance against perils such as lightning, windstorm, hail, vandalism, theft, uh, damage from vehicles, explosions, glass, etc., as well as personal liability. They have 17 broad form coverages, and then they have special all risk coverages that covers most everything except earthquakes and floods. And then there's renter's insurance. So personal property coverage is going to cover furniture, clothing, appliances. Um, there's riders, endorsements, and floaters. There's real property coverage for land and buildings attached to the land. So we're talking about a lot of coverage and a lot of potential damage and a lot of subrogation opportunity with personal um, insurance. Commercial insurance, we're talking commercial property, commercial general liability, commercial auto is huge. And we handle auto subrogation nationally for four of the, the largest auto carriers in the country. And it does keep us quite busy, as you can imagine. 
um, is there's a lot of lot of dollars paid out, but also a lot of dollar recovery opportunities that are missed, and we're going to try and fix some of that here today. Um, casualty insurance, uh, you know, casualty insurance I've always found was very hard to define. It insures against accidents and losses that aren't tied to any specific property. Um, aviation, boiler and machinery, glass and crime insurance, comprehensive insurance, theft, embezzlement. And I, I know a number of you have emailed me ahead of time, well, we'd like to hear about embezzlement and how to recover from, from you know, um, criminals stealing from their employer or this or that. I'm going to try and cover as much as I can, but like I said, we are going to be, we are going to be moving quickly um, as we proceed. So property and casualty damages. Um, this is an often misunderstood area in which uh, we are going to be asked to uh, pay out a certain amount based on the policy. We may have policies that pay out <clears throat> repair costs, some pay out replacement costs, some pay out actual, actual cash value or fair market value, and then we're, we're going to be asked to recover um, uh, that money in subrogation. Unfortunately, the U.S. tort laws don't allow us to always recover the same identical damages that we've paid. If we have a replacement cost policy, uh, a lot of times uh, state law will allow us only to recover repair value or the difference in market value before and after a loss. The picture shown on the slide is the Pizza Man restaurant that happened to be in Milwaukee, although most of our subrogate outside the state of Wisconsin. Um, this burnt down due to uh, an electrical malfunction and uh, the gentleman you see kneeling in front was our expert. Within 10 minutes after this photo was taken, uh, the authorities came by along with a bunch of graders and said the building had to be torn down uh, because it was of a danger to passing automobiles and you can see it's close to the street. Well, we went to try and get a TRO and, and, and preserve the loss, but the building was torn down by the city of Milwaukee and um, we subrogated as best we could without having full investigation. So uh, property and casualty damages um, also include the contents, personal property, uh, additional living expenses. This could be um, repair, a reasonable expense to repair property or uh, it could be um, uh, the additional living expenses could be uh, rentals or um, uh, whatever the policy basically pays for, we, we try to recover that money, including loss of rents, loss of profits, loss of use, uh, business income. These were all items of damages that um, we have to uh, try to recover based on the law of the state that we are currently in. Uh, subrogation, and again, I warned you that this was an introductory, um, and, and, and I'm going to just touch on this briefly, but it's important that we understand that subrogation, of course, and we've all heard this, it's the substitution of one person, usually the property carrier in the context of what we're discussing, uh, substitution of one person in place of another, usually the insured, with reference to a lawful claim or right, and that claim or right is the liability of the third party. Who's going to enforce that? Um, an example is a homeowner's house burns down due to a product defect in, say, a Black & Decker toaster oven. The carrier pays $250,000 for the loss and contents to the house, uh, and the carrier then sues Black & Decker to recover the $250,000. It settles for $175,000 because there's some aspect of the claim it may have a difficult time proving, and it repays a portion of the client's deductible, and the file is closed. Um, you know, subrogation is a very, very old concept. It goes all the way back to uh, ancient Rome and Emperor Hadrian. It's reinforced in the Magna Carta in 1215, and it simply uh, says that if the subrogee, the insurance company, pays an obligation of the subrogor, the third party, it wasn't a volunteer, and the subrogee is secondarily not primarily liable for the obligation, then the subrogor, the tortfeasor, will not suffer an injustice, and we can subrogate. That's subrogation 101. And how do we get that right? Well, um, a lot of times we get it through contractual subrogation, which is also known as conventional subrogation. And in your policy, there will be a clause similar to 
uh, are substantially similar to this particular clause. If we pay a claim under your policy, we will take over your right to recover that amount from any other person or organization. You agree to cooperate with us and not do anything that will interfere with our chances of recovery. And I underline that last, last sentence a lot of times and send it to insureds when they've been paid and they want nothing to do with our subrogation efforts. So we've had to sometimes get insureds to cooperate with us in subrogating uh, their claim. It's one of the hazards of subrogation, but it's something that has to be done. So this is a typical subrogation clause that we see in policies when it has to do with uh, contractual subrogation. There's also equitable subrogation. You don't necessarily need to have this clause in your policy in order to subrogate. Uh, there are also forms of statutory subrogation, such as workers' compensation, Medicare, Medicaid. And um, the purposes of subrogation are that we want to place the loss on the tortfeasor, on the wrongdoer. It prevents a double recovery, and it keeps premiums low and helps reduce the burden of insurance on the employing public, i.e., the small businesses in, in America. It serves a noble purpose. And um, so the, the science of insurance is that for a certain price or premium, a company is offering an opportunity to share the costs of a defined possible economic risk or loss. That's insurance. But since the risk is in the future and the exact risk or loss isn't known when the policy is issued, premiums and the amounts of coverage have to be calculated based on this unknown. And premiums are assessed based on a careful analysis of prior experience, uh, the cost of administration of the policy, uh, applicability of probability. Um, I, I'm probably not smart enough to be you know, underwriting, but I know it's a science. Uh, mathematics of chance play a role, and the likelihood that any loss will be recouped through subrogation is a category that, that is normally taken into consideration. So um, subrogation does serve a valid, valid purpose. Now, recognizing subrogation is perhaps the most important aspect of our industry. Those of you who are in claims and also have to put on your subrogation hat from time to time, um, you know, there's a natural human inclination to um, uh, consider it to be a lot of extra work. And it is a lot of extra work, but it carries with it great rewards if done properly and aggressively. And We've spent uh, the last 33 years helping carriers implement aggressive, successful, and cost-effective subrogation programs. To, to be successful, you have to recognize subrogation. If you don't recognize subrogation, you're not going to be able to pursue it. And this requires training. That's what we're doing here. And it requires experience. Only experience. Uh, I, what's the saying? Uh, uh, experience uh, comes from bad judgment and uh, good judgment comes from experience or something along those lines. It's so true in subrogation that you have to literally put aside some of your human predilections. You have to put aside your conservative uh, um, uh, insurance mentality that, well, most of these claims are malingerers and moaners and groaners, or this is probably insurance fraud, or the insurance company is trying to bilk us, and, and it was their own fault, <clears throat> uh, and, and really try to think of things like a trial lawyer would think of. It requires an understanding of tort law. And as I mentioned, our website has a lot of different webinars, including a webinar that has to do with recognizing subrogation which is basically a first-year law school torts class, a class that teaches you the ins and outs and the very basics of um, uh, American tort law, from product liability to premises liability to slip and fall to medical malpractice. All of these things have to go into the hopper uh, in order for, for you to be able to use that experience and make, make uh, good decisions. Um, so we have to understand tort law, and most importantly, we have to act promptly. I can tell you that the cases we have that require the most work and suffer the most dollar value loss as a result of inaction are those files in which action is not taken until after a claim is settled, until demand letters aren't sent out, until years after the loss. 
and witnesses have disappeared and evidence is gone and we'll talk a little bit about product liability in a little while and you'll see why this is so important so prompt recognition and action is required and what action is required I'm sorry it's just dirty work we have to do the investigation it, it is perhaps the first and only chance at getting this evidence identifying and retaining the evidence that we're going to have it falls on you the minute the claim comes in the clock is ticking in many cases parties are already working against you if there's a product that at issue some manufacturer may already be out there talking to witnesses inspecting uh, recording uh, taking film uh, taking photographs um, this is our job to do that and the time to do it is immediately after the claim is filed we have to catch witnesses when their memories are fresh we have to lock them into positions and testimony and, and I'll read that again lock witnesses into positions and testimony it is the most vital thing to do um, next to perhaps retaining the evidence so it doesn't disappear uh, I've always said the time and energy spent on a thorough investigation is inversely proportional to the cost of subrogating it it it, it bears out I mean the efforts that you take really do um, uh, pay off in the end in in ways that you can't even begin to anticipate when you first start your investigation. Um, your investigation is a walkthrough of your subrogation lawsuit, which is why it's important, going back to the last slide, to understand the elements of the tort that you're dealing with, be it premises liability or product liability. <laughs> you investigate because you want to identify all third parties and put everyone on notice. And lastly, investigation does help prevent um, uh, insurance fraud. Now, large property investigation uh, really isn't too much different than small loss property in, in investigation, except that uh, you know if you have a three thousand dollar loss, you're not going to be engaging the most expensive experts or um, flying people across the country because you're going to immediately spend more than the claim itself. But when you have large loss, you need an immediate response by an expert. You want to get a cause and origin expert out, an engineer, a surveyor, a civil engineer. You want to obtain all of the reports. Um, and by the way, again, this is introduction to property and casualty subrogation. We're going to cover the entire gamut today in an hour and a half. Um, there are other webinars on our website that deal solely with the investigation. So this one slide is an hour webinar and um, including charts and lists and suggestions so that may be something you want to watch they're completely free and they're on our website and by the way our website also contains a subrogation question feature many of you use it uh, we probably get 30 or 40 uh, inquiries a day from the website asking subrogation questions I have a Georgia policy Oklahoma accident uh, can I subrogate for collision damage when yada yada and, and whatever the question is we try and get you a complete and accurate answer usually within 24 hours but most frequently much more um, s sooner than that so we want to obtain the names of uh, all potential witnesses we want to get all the contracts consider a private investigator if it's a large claim get us involved if it's a large claim um, the goals of the defense are always going to be to find an alternate cause no matter what caused the accident, they're going to point to something else. Um, they're also going to talk about spoliation. If, if the cause was X, they're going to point to Y and Z as the potential causes and claim very convincingly that Y and Z were the causes of the accident. So what's the goal of subrogation? Our goal is also find the alternate causes, find the, the, the potential spoliation, and prevent those. Be prepared for uh, the manufacturer of the Black & Decker toaster oven to claim that it was the a blender sitting next to it on the counter that actually caused the loss. What does that mean? That means you have to retain the blender as well as the Black & Decker toaster. Um, so again, I, the, the value of investigation can't be, can't be overemphasized. And I often r refer to the value of it. And if you remember one thing from this webinar, remember this slide. There's a fable, an ancient fable, about two nomads who were traveling through the desert on their camels. They stopped and they were preparing camp for the evening when they suddenly were surrounded by a great light. They knew instantly that they were in the presence of a celestial being. And finally, the voice spoke. In a booming voice, it said, gather as many pebbles as you can. 
put them in your saddlebags, travel a day's journey, and tomorrow night you will be both glad and sad. Now the nomads were uh, perplexed. They had expected the revelation of a great universal truth, uh, but instead they were given a menial task which made no sense to them. However, although perturbed, each one did pick up a few pebbles and put them in their saddlebag. And the next day they talked about the, the, the appearance through the whole day's journey, and that night while making camp they reached into their saddlebags and discovered to their astonishment that the pebbles they had gathered that night before had turned into beautiful and brilliant diamonds. And indeed they were both glad and sad, that the, just as the voice had promised. They were glad that they now had these valuable diamonds, but they were sad that they hadn't taken the opportunity to fill their bags with pebbles when they had the chance. When you're investigating, you're looking for pebbles. And we'll refer to pebbles throughout this webinar. And what I'm talking about are the nuggets of facts, the witnesses, the evidence, the key photograph, the diagram, the contract, the witness statement that is going to be worth its weight in gold because it's going to be the key linchpin to allowing you to recover a significant dollar loss that otherwise you wouldn't have been able to. Now, um, as I indicated, there are webinars that will spend an entire hour on the things we just discussed about investigation. I urge you, especially if you are fairly new to subrogation or have a dual claims subrogation responsibility, it's not often easy to change, to flip out those hats and put on your subrogation cap. Watch those uh, webinars because they are very instructive. But let's talk about specific causes of action and let's start with product liability. Um, product liability <clears throat> is interesting because when I was in law school, and that was some 36 years ago, I found it interesting. I came as a young skull of mush. I went to law school and was told that the manufacturer of a product could be automatically liable, no matter how careful it was, even if it wasn't negligent, if there was a defect, either in design or manufacture or marketing, that was the producing cause of an injury. And I thought to myself back then, and I was probably a little more idealistic in my, my early 20s, but I thought to myself, well, that doesn't hardly seem fair. But America has institutionally determined that if there are significant losses due to a product defect, that loss should be borne by the manufacturer who enjoys the gains and profits of our free market system in selling the product and making a profit. Um, I'm not arguing with the concept. Uh, and there are times when, when we all hear about these tort reform cases or these frivolous lawsuits. Um, you go on our website and there's an article we've written about the McDonald's hot coffee case that I think will revolutionize the way you think about this. And remember, when you are subrogating, you need to take off your defense hat and put on your plaintiff's hat. It does cause you to step outside some of us, our comfort zones a little bit and become aggressive. When I first started practicing law, I started practicing under the tutelage of one of the best trial lawyers of all time, John O'Quinn out of Houston, Texas. John's dead now. He was in a tragic car accident because he was a horrible driver. But John taught me how to try a lawsuit. <clears throat> John has had more $100 million verdicts than any trial lawyer in history, F. Lee Bailey, you name it. He's been on the cover of Forbes magazine twice, represented four states in tobacco litigation, headed up the breast implant litigation, headed up the Agent Orange uh, class action suits, and I was involved in a lot of those, and learned from John O'Quinn how to try a lawsuit, that the most valuable aspect of your case isn't always the facts. Sometimes it's the plaintiff, and, and that there are just lawsuits and unjust lawsuits but you make your case. Um, and that's what I'm talking about today is making your case. So when you have a product liability cause of action, think creatively, think like a trial lawyer. You must identify and preserve the product and you must identify and preserve other products that might have been um, uh, the culprits or will be named as a culprit by a defendant who simply doesn't want to pay you money. And it's our job to make them pay that money. The chain of custody, once you get in, uh, a product, some of us realize, and I hope all of us realize, that you must meticulously document who handles that product, where it goes, 
and document in writing its chain of custody. The reason for this is more than just we feel it's good to do paperwork. The reason is because in order for, for strict liability uh, of a product manufacturer to be upheld, we must show that a product is in substantially the same condition as it was when the product was manufactured. What does that mean? If it goes through six or seven different hands, it's very easy for the manufacturer to say, wait a second, that's not the product we manufactured. There's some changes to it. And all of a sudden, there's all these questions about who handled the product, who had custody of the product. So it's important to keep that chain of custody preserved. Now, what is a manufacturing defect? <clears throat> Product bends, breaks, fails, leaks, ignites, explodes, or does something different than as designed. That's a manufacturing defect. Uh, the, the, something fails on the car. The brake line breaks or busts or explodes or there's a the leaking of something or something is, is, you know, something doesn't function the way it's intended to as a manufacturing defect. A design defect means that a product does conform to its plans and specs. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. But the design itself renders the product unreasonably dangerous. There's a pinch point. There's a place for a, a machine operator to catch his hand and tear off his, his arm. Um, those are design de defects. <clears throat> Both require experts, but the design defect requires an expert who has an expertise in design. So we'll talk in, in just a few minutes about experts, and I have some advice about, about experts that you use and experts you shouldn't use. Um, a marketing defect is, of course, a failure to warn. These cases are harder to make and harder to win, but we have won them. And we'll talk about a few examples of uh, prevailing in, in just a few minutes. When you investigate a product's liability case, you want to know which type of, of defect you may be working with. Immediately engage an expert, obtain the product, get an, uh, the name and, and a statement of the operator, who manufactured it, where was the product purchased if you're having problems with this. Make your expert do his job. He's supposed to find this out for you. Find out from the, <clears throat> the insured or the owner of the product, were there modifications? If there were, we may have problems with the case. Were there repairs? If there were, we may have a second tortfeasor to pursue. Was maintenance performed? If so, who did it? If outside maintenance was done and it could have contributed to the loss, we have a third defendant. And um, uh, these, these are things to remember. The operator and service manual, the maintenance records, get those things. And then there's the economic loss doctrine. <clears throat> uh, the economic loss doctrine, I mentioned here, there's an entire webinar on it, is simply the uh, notion that if you have a product defect, let's say you have a press, and the press malfunctions due to a defect of design or manufacturing, and it burns up, and it's a million dollar press. Um, <clears throat> American tort law does not allow, allow us to pursue the manufacturer in tort for damage to the product itself. Now, the economic loss doctrine is much broader than that. But, but in terms of what we're talking about here, just remember that you can't always sue a product manufacturer for damage only to the product itself. There usually has to be some outside uh, damage. I mean, if you have a car in a garage and it burns down the garage, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And some of you may have some questions. But uh, a couple of uh, anecdotal examples <clears throat> of a product's case is this construction heater was the subject of um, a huge fire which occurred in central Wisconsin back in February of 2005. Uh, the insured was finishing up the last of a dozen large multi-unit condominiums on a, on a lake not far from um, uh, central Wisconsin where there was this huge resort. And it was in February, and what happens in February in Wisconsin, especially when there's melting snow and refreezing snow, you had a um, <clears throat> elevator shaft shown here. Now, this, by the way, was a fully constructed building, which burnt down. And this elevator shaft, I, I say fully constructed, um, there, there was some roof work yet to be done. And as a result, this elevator shaft filled with about three feet of, of ice in the bottom. So in order to complete the elevator, they had to melt the ice. So what they did <clears throat> is they took this product here, hooked it up to gas, and stuck the nose of the product into the elevator shaft, as shown here. And they constructed cardboard around the nose of the heater in order to keep the heat in the elevator unit. Now, 
one of the features of this product is that at its nose it had a thermostat that would allow you I'm sorry I just, I'm, you can see right next to the start and stop button there's a thermostat that takes the, the the ambient temperature of the environment and says okay it's 80 degrees okay now you turn the heater on and when it gets to be 90 degrees it turns off automatically well they set this to 90 degrees and stuck the nose into the elevator and built um, wood plywood right up to the walls of the of the blue nose of the of the sure flame heater and what happened was <clears throat> the interior of the elevator shaft literally became a pizza oven with temperatures of upwards of 400 degrees. This shoots out flames and heats rather effectively. Uh, 400,000 BTUs or a million BTUs, I forgot exactly what it is. Uh, but in any event, what happened within short time is they left this thing run thinking the thermostat would turn it off, but uh, alas, the thermostat was outside of the elevator shaft. So. We claimed, um, because our job is to think like a trial lawyer, that the product was defective because sticking its nose in there, a, a normal operator would suspect that um, it would turn off, even though it didn't. Now, there was nearly $10 million in property damage here, and you can see the way it was set up. The defense claimed, and I'm sure you're thinking, well, you shouldn't set this up in such a way that you had combustible material, because it says right on the warning, which you actually can't read here, it says that you shouldn't, um, here's the warning, you shouldn't put this near combustibles, and it says 12 feet from the front, 5 feet from the top, 2 feet from the inlet, 2 feet from the sides. Well, the insured did violate that, but um, we argue that this was a traditional and widely accepted use of this type of construction heater, which the owner condoned. Now, of course, uh, the manufacturer, rather, the uh, manufacturer contested that, and um, there was confusion in the warnings, and the lack of a remote thermostat made this dangerous. We had almost $250,000 in experts' fees in the and the experts couldn't recreate the loss. It was an excruciating case to handle, um, but the issue came down to whether or not they condoned this type of use, or if they said no, and we were able to locate on their website this photograph, which showed the exact use that our insured had used and was worth about eight million dollars so it's the eight million dollar photograph and it wasn't obtained with the use of experts despite spending two hundred fifty thousand dollars it was located by one of our paralegals who took the time to search the history of websites I forgot the name of the site but you can go back and look at, at websites the way they were two three years ago and we were able to locate this which indicated that this was shown as an acceptable use of the construction heater. So the, my point in this isn't to get into the nuances of this case, but to let you know that um, sometimes the most valuable efforts that are undertaken aren't obtained through expensive experts, but through just a little bit of work and uh, an investigation. Now experts, we talked about them. Let's talk about hiring experts. When to hire an expert? choosing an expert. Um, experts are a funny thing because most of, our, most of us are approached by vendors, by uh, expert companies, by expert referral services. Oh, we'll find you an expert. They're very cheap. For $200, we'll have a quote-unquote expert who is actually an investigator uh, go out and do a summary, take a bunch of photographs, and it, at the end he'll say, well, I think the fire started somewhere under the hood. Okay, that report is worth zero dollars. Unless you simply want them for investigation, the report isn't going to cut it and it isn't going to get us to, uh, to a jury. So you want to hire the right expert. Um, today, the Federal Rules of Evidence 702 authorizes trial judges to be the gatekeeper and determine whether or not experts uh, will be allowed to testify, and they're getting much more restrictive. Before 1993, before the Daubert decision, it was a federal case, which dealt with 
expert testimony was primarily evaluated for admissibility by using the quote-unquote general acceptance test uh, under a 1923 um, uh, District of Columbia case, a federal court case. And under that test, <clears throat> expert opinions based on scientific technique was inadmissible unless the technique was generally accepted. Well, that's an easy hurdle. But in 1993, after the Daubert versus Merrill Dow Chemicals uh, Pharmaceuticals case, the court suggested four factors. Now, in order to get an expert in, and we must think about this before we hire our experts, the court has to ask whether a theory or technique can be or has been tested, whether the theory or technique has been subjected to peer review and publication, whether in retrospect or whether in respect to a particular technique there is a known or potential rate of error, and whether the technique enjoys general acceptance within the relevant scientific community. It's a much more stringent burden, and experts are being struck because you just can't get a mechanical engineer to come in and talk about the design of a, of a, a Ford um, uh, you know, probe uh, that has a defect in it because they're not qualified, and they won't be qualified by that judge to testify. Uh, in 1999, another case um, erased any doubts about whether technical expert testimony and scientific ex ex expert testimony are subject to the same standards they are. So what you want to do is make sure you don't go with the cheapest expert. A lot of times you have this opportunity for an expert to do a level one review of a case or something, and then you get this, this investigator with a, you know, a high school diploma who will come in and take a bunch of photographs and describe what he sees, and then he gratuitously says, well, I think the fire might have started under, uh, you know, the, the, um, this, this, this switch here, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, and, and what's happening is because you've reduced that to writing, it can often damage your case. So you may or may not want an expert to write a report uh, if it's a significant loss until you know that the expert is qualified. Um, cause and origin experts and fire losses um, often I see, well, we, I hear we have a cause and origin expert that we hired, and I look, and it's really not a cause and origin expert. It's an origin expert. It's a fire investigator who's trained in fire investigation. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, it's not a cause expert. Uh, you want to first find the cause. I'm, I'm first find the origin of a fire, but, and then only then do you want to uh, determine what the cause is, and you're going to need an electrical, a mechanical, a chemical, uh, engineer in order to do that, and uh, in some cases you may have to have um, uh, accident reconstructionist. So it's important that we have the right expert, and the cheapest expert isn't always the right expert, but my last bullet point here, budget and cost effectiveness are essential elements of subrogation. You cannot spend yourself into a successful subrogation program. If you have a large loss, subrogation is and always is an investment. Um, I, I see far too many companies trying to skimp and, 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 and cut corners on subrogation, and in most instances, you'd be better off not spending a dime than spending half of what you need to spend. It's very, very important that we understand it is an investment, and it will pay off, and it's actually a very good investment in most cases, and, and it's something that, uh, but it has to be handled cost effectively. So you don't want the most expensive expert working on the smaller cases. We have a database of over 35,000 experts across the country. We keep it current. Just today, we added six, six or seven new experts that came to us, um, and they know we have this database, and they say, can we be included on in your database? So our clients come to us, and they say, I need an automotive <clears throat> mechanical engineer in Columbus, Ohio, for a $12,000 case. Well, OK, automatically, I'm going to take the, the top tier uh, the top shelf experts off the list because I'm not going to hire somebody that's going to cost 20 grand to come in on a, on a case of that size. But I will find somebody who is qualified, who is priced correctly, and who is um, has the expertise and technical know-how to provide us with the opinions that we need. So if you shoot us uh, an inquiry through the website, the subrogation question website, um, uh, and ask us, tell us what you need, we can also always find an expert for you, and we often see these experts when the cases are then later referred to us. Now, in fire and explosion cases, um, <clears throat> you want to ask yourself one key question, and that is, who else owns this fire? You already own it. You insured the loss. You're paying it, so you own this loss. Who else can we get to own this fire? Investigation is the key. It's the real-life uh, subrogation CSI. 
you must collect as much data, facts as you possibly can. Again, origin is first, uh, cause is second, um, and uh, the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, publication number 921, I mention uh, it gets a little bit nuanced for an introductory webinar, but I mention it because it's important. Um, the NFPA produces a number of documents to develop a consensus of experts and approved by the uh, by ANSI, the American National Standards uh, Association, I believe. And this includes all the code standards, recommended practices, and guides. There, it includes the National Electric Code, NFPA 70, the Life Safety Code, which is NFPA something um, 101. I no, well, I forgot. The National Fuel um, gas code is NFPA 54. So years ago, fire science was voodoo science. You had experts come in and say, well, I noticed beating on the copper wiring, therefore the fire occurred here, which is absolutely wrong. And it usually had no bearing on the true cause and origin. Um, these were urban legends that experts used, and it, it was junk science. Well, the NFPA 921 establishes scientific principles. So um, it's, it's agreed upon by judges. It's not a code. It is a guide recommending practices. Some experts don't believe in it. Don't use them. Number one question. Hi, expert. We'd like to hire you. We have a $50,000 loss in Lexington, Kentucky. Do you follow the NFPA 921? Do you have a copy? Um, <clears throat> I mean, make, make sure that they, they follow this because it's important in order for their testimony to stand up. Um, one of the things that <clears throat> in this introductory course that we want to talk about is uh, inland and ocean marine cargo losses. Uh, inland marine is not an oxymoron. Uh, historically, ocean marine insurance held that the transporter of cargo uh, was responsible for property loss before, during, and after completion of a voyage. Um, remember, cargo tra can, can be um, uh, transported from foreign port to U.S. port via freighter. Uh, uh, a cargo ship, and then from there via intermodal, it can be loaded onto a semi, and <clears throat> from there to a train, and uh, it's it's a complex journey that that many of the cargos take that may be uh, damaged or we have to pay a claim on. But um, Ocean Marine covers the loss of damage of ships, cargo, terminals, and any transport or cargo by which property is transferred, acquired, or held between points of origin and final destination. What's interesting is that we had a loss, a huge loss, not too long ago uh, down in Illinois at a Skipper Buds. It was, an on, it was a land-based marina that was storing lots of expensive um, yachts and expensive ships. And uh, there was a fire as a result of negligent uh, maintenance. Uh, somebody left a halogen lamp on, and it started a fire, and it burned the whole place down. Uh, millions and millions of dollars in damage, and a good portion of those our client insured. And um, you have to be careful because there's a lot of limitation of liability clauses that may or may not play a role, depending on whether something is marine or whether it's land-based. Um, and uh, there are a lot of nuances to inland and ocean marine subrogation um, that we have to be aware of. With cargo claims, uh, you can have uh, ocean shipments. Um, uh, you can have international air carriage. You can have domestic air carriers. Um, the uh, Carriage of the Goods on, on High Seas Act, the COGSA, allocates the risk of loss and creates predictable liability rules. Um, it's, it's really a good way to think of cargo losses is it's so incredibly simple because with the Carmack Amendment, and I, I know you may not be familiar with some of these terms, the Carmack Amendment and COGSA, these are strict liability statutes. If, if the goods are shipped and they don't end up in, in good condition, uh, the carrier is responsible. Uh, but, and this is a huge but, there are defenses. And a lot of defenses that have to do with, um, uh, say, an act of God or public enemy, uh, act or omission of the shipper, most common of which is the claims uh, the shipper failed to properly load um, uh, or pack the cargo. Um, and the rule generally is if the carrier can see the problem, it may not be able to claim this. Uh, 
but there's a duty to refuse, inherent vice, something's wrong with the cargo itself, strikes or riots, authority of law, you know, uh, the ship is seized by the authorities, or some such, there's all kinds of defendant, uh, defenses, but generally it's strict liability, and these cargo claims are good, subject to another defense that uh, they give the, um, uh, the carrier, and that is, Although the carrier can't relieve itself of liability through contract, it can't say, hey, I'll carry your goods, but if what happens in the picture you see on the slide in front of you happens to my ship, we're not going to be responsible for the cargo loss. Take it or leave it. You can't do that. If they try and do that, it's void. However, you can limit liability, uh, and this is true with uh, moving vans and moving household goods, as well as cargo across the country, as long as it's interstate um, uh, you can, uh, the carrier can limit liability by including, including a limitation of liability provision in the bill of lading. And, uh, but, but don't automatically assume that you can't subrogate or that you're, you're left with a $60 per pound limitation, a uh, 60 cents per pound rather, a uh, limitation. Um, just because that's in there, they have to maintain approved tariffs, they have to obtain the shipper's written declaration of a choice. Uh, they have to give the shipper reasonable notice, an opportunity to choose between two or more different levels of liability. So uh, the default is full value. If this stuff isn't done, then they're liable for full value. Uh, the shipper of household goods, if you're dealing with uh, moving vans and losses such as that, you can have a, uh, you can often get attorney's fees and interest and, and, and things on top, but there's deadlines. And this is imp this is why it's important to consult with subrogation counsel, you know, after after losses, because for a lot of these claims, these cargo claims, you have to submit a claim to the carrier within 120 days. That 120 days goes by awful quickly when you're adjusting a large loss. It's 120 days after the shipment is delivered, or the date where it was scheduled to be de delivered, whichever is later. Uh, and um, then a the shipper. Uh, you know, then, then you have a certain time period in which to to file suit. So these are important considerations. Again, it's just we're just touching on some of these issues. When we're talking about uh, evidence um, preservation and spoliation, by the way, the picture shown here is that Skipper Bud's um, <coughs> warehouse in Illinois that uh, burnt, and you can see the green ship that's sort of in the middle there. That was some sort of a famous ship that's been in some movies. It was 1932. I think Humphrey Bogart was on it at one point, and it's made with this imported teak wood, and it was just meticulous. That's just one of the many, many yachts and large ships that were burnt. Um, when you have a large loss, I, I would I would tell you, and this isn't a, uh, well, I would just tell you to make sure <clears throat> to get some some help. Um, you don't want to be responsible for organizing large losses where just one mistake could cost you um, significant dollars in recovery potential. We must preserve the scene immediately. We had a TRO in this case where we literally went and had the judge order that the owners of these ships were not to be allowed to come in. They wanted to come in and get their personal belongings, their, their photographs, you know, uh, whatever whatever personal effects they had on the boat to see if they that was damaged and burnt, and we had to say no because we weren't quite sure where the origin of the fire was, and we had to make sure that none of this was spoliated. If you can imagine, the defendant, the ultimate defendant in this case, was a repair service that was hired to come in and work on one particular boat and let the halogen lamp burn, but he would be pointing to all of these these goofballs climbing all over the ships, removing all sorts of things, and say, well, anybody could have moved this this evidence. And um, it would have made the case extremely difficult. When we talk about spoliation, um, <clears throat> it means that the evidence was not preserved, or the evidence was tainted, or all of the evidence wasn't obtained. I tried a house case fire down in Texas a number of years ago uh, involving a low voltage failure on a um, intermatic control that ran um, outdoor lighting, you know, um, whatever you call it, the lighting that lights up the trees in the house. And in, in that particular case, there was a tiny wire that fell out of the intermatic control uh, when it was being shoveled from the inside of the house to the outside of the house by the fire department. And the defense was able to get an instruction um, based on spoliation. So if evidence is spoliated, you may have some significant problems 
in terms of trying your case. You can get your case dismissed or you can get an adverse inference. But, but when you have an inspection that's required, put all potentially interested parties on notice. That, that is very time consuming. You'd be surprised how many interested parties they may be. They don't have to come to the party, but you have to invite them. Schedule a joint inspection. Give people enough time to show up. Preserve the key evidence. Establish a protocol. Your experts should be doing this. The attorneys you hire should be doing this. Get a chain of custody. All of this stuff makes for a seamless uh, subrogation case when you have, especially in larger cases where you're concerned about um, potential defenses. Um, we were asked <clears throat> to talk just a little bit about subrogation and restitution, and I think it's important in this. Um, you know, we will see cases involving burglary or arson or theft or other crimes by, by third parties. Um, uh, criminals are usually deadbeats by definition, okay? They're, they're not committing arson and theft and other crimes because they're well off and have all these assets that you can go after them for, and they're certainly not going to be insured for intentional acts and crimes. So when you have actions like this, when you have somebody who breaks into a house or a condo under construction and sets a fire, uh, be it kids or whatever, you, you often want to know what your options are. Um, <clears throat> there is a um, charts, and by the way, we have a number of charts on our website some of you are familiar with, and I would urge you to, to check them out. Uh, they are all charts that, that summarize the law in all 50 states on various topics. Um, a couple of the topics that are relevant here are we have a chart called Subrogation of Criminal Restitution in all 50 states. We want to get court order restitution. Um, despite the fact that some courts are a little bit lenient when, when horrible crimes are committed, they, they, they're, they, they do have court orders for restitution uh, of victims. And depending on what state you're in, you, the subrogated carrier, may be considered a victim because of your subrogation status. Um, this chart goes through how to um, uh, submit a request for court-ordered restitution, whether you can, whether you are considered a victim, and how to deal with that. But there's also another chart called parental responsibility laws. When you have minors committing crimes, uh, every state has a law which uh, has some sort of parental legal liability responsibility law that holds parents or legal guardians responsible for property damage, personal injury, theft, shoplifting, and or vandalism resulting from the intentional or willful acts of minors and or unemancipated children. All right, is that fair? I'm not here to debate whether it's fair. Uh, you know, I've, my, my kids are now grown, but I can tell you that I would have hated to have been on the legal liability end of, of something that they did that created a lot of damage. But this statutory liability is almost strict liability. But it is limited. And in some of your small cases, uh, for example, in the state of Alaska, uh, liability is imposed on a parent for a child's willful or malicious damage to real or personal property. And the dollar limit is significant, $15,000, $25,000 if there's insurance. These are opportunities that we must look at. Look at this chart when you have claims like this, um, $10,000 in Arizona. Uh, you know, and this chart also gets into if a minor um, or a, a, um, a, not a student driver, but a driver with a temp license uh, is involved in an accident, what the sponsor is responsible for. So as a parent, you, may, you have to sign in many states something that says, well, I'll be uh, responsible for this child's actions until he gets his, his or her, you know, driver's license. These are things we want to know about. So getting an order of subrogation restitution, an abstract of judgment, these are, these are often uh, productive tools in the, 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 the subrogation war that we're fighting. And then we can file those with the court recorder, and it can go a long way. Now, uh, this is not an irreverent title. I often say this. I've, I've actually presented a webinar. And there's a separate webinar on the, on the um, on our website that you can watch for free. I give it, and it's in, it's I think it's a two-hour entitled Subrogating Against God. Uh, I, I don't mean to be irreverent. Uh, actually, I mean to give God a whole lot of credit because um, uh, tongue-in-cheek I'm saying, look, God can't be sued for sending a hurricane, a flood, a wildfire, or a hailstorm. He's beyond the reach of subpoenas. He's beyond the reach of service of citation. And in fact, we recognize that by in every state uh, we have an act of God defense, which simply says um, God is not going to be a third party. So when we have a natural disaster, we have to look beyond 
the act of God. We have to look to man-made causes. And um, again, now your thoughts may be running to, well, that's not really fair. If there's a huge flood, why should someone be responsible for this huge natural disaster? Um, uh, my partner, James Buselner, in in our New Orleans office, lived through Katrina and just talked at the CLM conference uh, this year, I think, or maybe it was last fall, about subrogating natural disasters and gave the example of Katrina. There have been successful subrogation efforts with Katrina. Um, yeah, perhaps the most politically incorrect, uh, uh, the natural disaster to choose, but our job is to, is to be the terminator. We, we are to cover subrogation dollars and never, ever, ever, ever stop and to recover as much as possible. And one way to do that is to take off your defense myopia uh, and put on your plaintiff's attorney's hat, your trial lawyer's hat, because when you have a flood, um, it isn't always just the fact that an act of God resulted in eight inches of rain over a 45-minute period, which resulted in massive flooding across wide areas of the country. It is what happens with that water when it's when it when it finally finds its course, water is extremely predictable. It will always behave in the same way. As a result, experts can um, arrive at computer models called HEC2 or HECRAS uh, computer models, which I've used in a number of cases to literally recreate a flood: where the water went, how high it was here, when it over you know over top the the hoods of cars or entered a building. And, and what often happens is it's man's action that causes the damage because man uh, or some negligent act of some company or some entity disturbed the topography or had construction or altered a waterway or built a dike or uh, uh, an impromptu um, uh, de facto dam that caused water to behave in a certain way and caused water to go onto a neighboring property rather than his own property. So you can have tort damage occur in these instances. Um, in the case of, uh, and, and by the way, I won't go into all of these. You may be saying, well, how can you possibly uh, subrogate a hailstorm or an ice storm? Uh, I'll, I'll leave that for a second webinar because we, are, have, we have limited time. A roofing subrogation, I had a case involving a, um, a tornado uh, in, uh, I think it was Topeka, Kansas, and there were some darn downtown buildings that had gravel roofs. And of course, this tornado, an act of God, whipped some of this gravel and threw it uh, a considerable distance onto about uh, 800 automobiles, brand new uh, Mercedes that were in this this showroom, not a showroom, but a, 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 a car lot, a car dealership lot, and they were damaged to a, to a significant degree. And some of them couldn't be restored because of the, the Mercedes policies. So we had a significant loss. We were able to show that the people who did that roof didn't follow appropriate protocol. We were able to show with an expert that had, even with a tornado, this was the only building where gravel was thrown off the top of it in such quantity to cause this type of damage. We were able to, with a geologist, show and prove where the rocks came from and then show that the people who did the roof didn't use the appropriate tar, didn't use the appropriate procedures or the appropriate order for doing the procedures, and we were successful in that subrogation effort. Again, think subrogation. Think like a trial lawyer. <clears throat> I'll go back to 1993. It's an, added, it's an anecdotal case that I use, but it's instructive because it's not always the technical expert with the three PhDs that's going to find the smoking gun. Sometimes you must find the smoking gun. Here's an example. Um, the Upper Mississippi River Basin in 93 words at the time. It was the worst natural disaster in the U.S. I mean, $20 billion in damage affected nine states. 50 people died. But there was one flood in Kenosha, Wisconsin <clears throat> on this property um, that was of particular interest to the Lloyd's underwriters, who were my client at the time. And you can see in the center, upper center, that there looks like a railroad spur. And this was a railroad spur directly from uh, that was used by Subaru of America, Inc., they're located in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. They had a manufacturing facility in Ohio. This is where they delivered all of their cars, and you can see, um, you can see all of the cars. There were 3,000 brand new Subarus parked in in this this area that is etched out. 
Um, this was the launching point for their intermodal transport of these cars to the entire west. Anything west of the Rockies, California, Washington, Arizona, this is where the cars were, were marshaled before they were sent to the dealerships. And this particular property was owned by Chicago Northwestern Railroad. And what happened was um, Chicago Northwestern Railroad put tons and tons of gravel on this um, piece of property. And they raised uh, the, the level of the property, but they altered the topography. And because it's altered, and you can tell it's altered because it looks different than the property around it, um, the local authorities had no record of the fact that this was actually a flood plain. So Chicago Northwestern Railroad, Railroad um, they, <clears throat> they hid the fact that this was a flood plain because they, they were making a lot of money renting this property as a, uh, a launching point uh, for, for these Subarus to the west. Well, <clears throat> one night in 93, we had this large flood. Water went above. It started rising. Uh, there was a security service uh, down in the lower left. You can see right across from the farm. That's where the Whack and Hut security was. Well, these guys were playing cards and drinking and what else. And, and the water was rising and rising. And uh, the water went above the dashboards in some of these cars, um, but only above the floorboards and others. And in Subaru, the ABS modular modules were located on the floorboards. You had capillary action of waters. Most of the 3,000 Subarus had to be crushed. So we're looking at a significant loss, 20 plus million dollars. It was just a significant loss. And we were asked to subrogate. This is one of the files that was marked, um, no subrogation by, by Lloyd's. And we did a, um, a subrogation review, which we do for a lot of our clients, out at the old Lloyd's Claim building on Lime Street in London, and found this file. And I said, well, wait. Have you looked at the topography? Have you had a hydrologist look at what caused this water to rise in this particular area? Well, no. We, it was an act of God. Well, OK, that's the problem. Um, we, we weren't thinking like trial lawyers. So we took the file. I asked for $50,000 to hire some experts. We did some computer mod, mod, modular, or, uh, model studies. And we were able to prove um, that this was we, we, we suspected this was not only a floodplain, uh, but uh, the topography was altered in such a way, and the grates and the and the uh, drainage was altered in such a way that it caused this this area to retain water. Um, <clears throat> there was a um, uh, here's a picture of the, this is after the flooding. The next morning, the height of the flooding was about uh, one o'clock in the morning, and. Um, we put, uh, this article was in the paper in the Kenosha News at the time I was practicing out of Houston, Texas. And uh, I don't know if you can read it, but generally what I said is I'm looking for people, good people in Kenosha to come forward who know this property because it was, it was a uh, American Motors used to be in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And this was an American Motors property and they stored cars there as well. And I wanted anecdotal information with regard to there was, whether there was flooding there in, in many years ago. And <clears throat> Our experts, you know, talked to people, and we couldn't find anything. So what I did was I traveled to this particular lower left-hand corner. You can see there's a farm. This farmer was 84, 85 years old, and I walked over there one day, and I said, tell me what you remember when you were a young boy and just lived on this farm his whole life. Well, in between bites of apple pie and coffee that his wife was serving us, he brought out a little stack of notebooks that went all the way back to the early 50s, um, which detailed in seven different rain gauge areas on their property and on the property that you see in front of you, uh, rainfall, um, <clears throat> uh, dates, times, history. It was, it was the holy grail. Um, we produced that report, and we were able to show, and that was the linchpin in proving that Chicago Northwestern Railroad knew that they were storing cars on a floodplain. And uh, as a result of that, we were able to recover not the entire amount, but a significant amount such that Subaru, who had been canceled by a Commercial Union and the London underwriters, the syndicates, two particular syndicates in, in, at Lloyd's, um, we actually were able to get them back together 
because of this recovery, and uh, they rewrote uh, Subaru and saved them a significant amount of money. So subrogation, in addition to being a societal benefit, is also a business benefit in some cases. So um, that's an example of why subrogating acts of God should be pursued. In cases involving electrical fires, um, you want an electrical engineer. Don't get a mechanical engineer. Don't get an investigator. Don't fall for the dog and pony shows and the PowerPoints of uh, the, the vendors who come in and say, well, for, send us every file you have and we'll do you know, a level one uh, inspection and it won't be much more than just a couple of pictures. And uh, then <clears throat> if you want to go to level two, we'll do. I, it sounds like you're saving money, but in the long run, you're probably losing more than you're saving. Excuse me one minute. Apologize. I wanted to get a drink of water. Um, so these are some things that to follow the site examination protocol, identify your defendants, um, and put put parties on notice. Um, property involving, uh, say, bailment. There's an area you'll run into where if if you uh, stop at a parking lot and turn your keys over to the parking lot attendant, and then go to your play or to whatever you're going to, and you come back and your your car is gone or it's stolen, or it's damaged, um, you have a claim for bailment. Bailment is a type of contract in which uh, the bailor, that would be you, the owner of the property, or you're insured, um, <clears throat> turns over custody of property to a custodian or a bailee. This could be a car dealership for repairs, and then the car dealership puts the car outside their secure area because it's fixed and they're waiting for you to come pick it up or it could be a parking garage, it could be a bank safety deposit box, it could be the dry cleaners with uh, valuables, or it could be valet parking. But the elements of bailment are that you have the delivery of personal property to another person for a specific purpose. It's an exp either express or implied contract. It's both a tort action and a contract action. And the bottom line is if they don't return the property to you in the same condition, they are uh, there is a presumption of negligence. As long as you have bailment, delivery, acceptance, and consideration, you have a bailment. If I take my car to the dealership early because I have to get to work and I drop it off and put the keys in the visor, and then I drive away and then they say, well, we never got your car. It was stolen. There is no bailment because there's been no delivery. They didn't accept um, custody of the car. Once they accept custody of the car, it's on them. We make them own this loss, not us. There's a presumption of negligence. What does that mean? That means that uh, once we've proven bailment, then they have the burden to come and prove that um, it was through no negligence of their own. How do they do that? Well, they would show that the car was inside their locked <coughs> service garage and that <coughs> they had turned on the security alarm and that they had not left anything burning <coughs> Uh, that would have burned the place down, and uh, that somehow an, uh, an experienced and talented uh, criminal burglar broke in and stole the car, and that they had the keys locked up. I mean, you know, there's all these different levels. Um, limitation liability, exculpatory clauses, clauses. Don't let those scare you. You turn your coat in, and it says not responsible for lost coats. Don't buy it for a minute. Um, <clears throat> although jurisdictions vary. In the absence of a comparable statute, the courts have generally held that attempts by a bailee to contract against his own negligence violates public policy and is void. So these are these are good good cases when you have cases of bailment, and it can be anything. We see them quite often in in uh, valet cases. So what are some of the obstacles um, to um, subrogation? <clears throat> um, before I, oh, I, I'm reminded by Jamie that we, we are going to have a trivia question. Um, trivia question is something we, we do in, in our webinars. Um, and the first person to respond to Jamie uh, at jbreen, J-B-R-E-E-N, at mwl-law.com. I think you guys have her email again, j-b-r-e-e-n at mwl-law.com. With the correct answer to the trivia question, we'll win. <coughs> Um, an all-expense paid trip to Greece. No, she's telling me it's only a book. Sorry about that. Uh, we, you will win one of our books. Um, we have several books to choose from. Whichever one you want, they're, they're actually are very in value because I'm not sure why our publisher does that. 
uh, fundamentals of insurance coverage, work comp, auto, ERISA. <clears throat> There's a, a where's the beef subrogating um, uh, vehicle damage uh, trucks that run into cattle on the road. Uh, again, it's a good subject to talk about. Uh, we have a book that discusses all of that and contains the law in all 50 states. Um, and uh, But anyway, the trivia question is as follows. Look at your computer keyboard. Only one of the 50 states can be typed using only one row of keys. Now, this assumes no capitalization. Which state is it? Only one of 50 states can be typed using only one row of keys. Which state is it? First one to uh, get with Jamie with that answer. I'll announce it in a minute and uh, also let her know. She'll, she'll contact you and ask you which book uh, you, you want. So again, obstacle. <clears throat> um, in, in ancient times, a king would place a boulder on a roadway. Um, uh, and, and he would hide, he, this is another fable, the king would put a, put a boulder on the roadway and he'd hit himself and watch to see if anybody would remove the big rock. Some of the king's wealthiest merchants would come by and the courtiers would come by and they'd simply walk around the rock. Many loudly blamed the king for not keeping the roads clear, but none did anything about getting the big stone out of the way. Then a peasant came along carrying a load of vegetables. On approaching the boulder, the peasant laid down his vegetables and um, uh, tried to move the stone to the side of the road. After much pushing and straining, he finally succeeded. And as he picked up his load of vegetables and was about to move on, he noticed a large purse lying in the road where the boulder had been. The purse was full of coins and a note from the king indicating that the gold was for the person who removed the boulder from the roadway. So the peasant learned what many others never seem to understand. Every obstacle presents an opportunity, and this is true in subrogation. I say it and I emphasize it because human nature is such that subrogation represents for many of us a thorn in our side. We are told we have to subrogate. Subrogate doubles the amount of work we have to do on a claim, or more. And human nature is such that we want to run away from it. We want to just enter into the file, no subrogation, file closed. Um, <clears throat> check with us. Let us do some of the work for you. But I can tell you, and this is true, the five largest recoveries we've ever had, including the one we just went through with the Subaru vehicles, um, five of the, the five largest recoveries we've had were all files that were closed. And they were all files in which somewhere within the file it was marked no subrogation. Obstacles to property subrogation present opportunity. This is especially true in property subrogation, the made whole doctrine. These are things that we're not going to go into great depth on um, because we have other webinars that deal with them. Again, we're just introduction. Made whole doctrine, the insured has to be made whole before you can recover. Um, many exceptions, many instances in which it doesn't apply. If the contract the policy says that we can subrogate anyway, there are lots of states that allow us to recover despite the made whole doctrine. Economic loss doctrine we've talked about, statute of limitations, there may be statutes of repose which simply say, look, you have so many years after substantial completion of a building before you can sue an architect, an engineer, or somebody responsible for improvements to that property. Governmental liability, huge, huge, huge. We have a new um, webinar that's going to be coming out soon and a chart, the only chart in existence, by the way, because this doesn't exist anywhere, that is going to detail what can be subrogated and what can't in terms of uh, proprietary actions, discretionary actions, municipalities, counties, states, federal government, notice, uh, dollar limitations. We're going to have it all in one place. And <clears throat> the most important thing is notice, 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 notice. There are some states like Texas where each state, I'm sorry, each city has its own charter. And some cities have notice periods as little as 30 days, others three months, others six months. So um, these, these things have to be followed meticulously and lean on us to help you. Subrogation waivers, exculpatory clauses, uh, landlord tenant, implied coinsurance. We have a chart <clears throat> on this subject for all 50 states. You may want to subrogate against the tenant for leaving a, a cardboard box on a, on a burning stove which burns down the entire apartment complex or condominium building. Um, but in some states, the state law says that the tenant is the implied co-insured of the landlord and can't be um, sued. <clears throat> Yet you, you have to know which state you're dealing with, and sometimes the lease itself um, plays a key role in um, whether or not you're going to have that, that ability. 
Um, the main whole doctrine um, can be contractually gotten around, um, and that is that is something that's uh, we I, we have a chart on the main whole doctrine in all 50 states as well. I know we're kind of chart happy here, but the problem with subrogation <clears throat> and the problem with property subrogation is that we are expected to be experts not just in one state but in multiple states and for some of you in all 50 states depending on where you write and even if you write in only a handful of states you're insured may travel to another state and you have to be familiar with the law there so not all subrogation law is conducive to a chart but um, it will uh, often be something that you, you need to be familiar with and we, we hope these charts are a way of helping you be familiar with with those things. Subrogation waivers, exculpatory clauses, as I've indicated, most states will hold that if an insured enters into a contract um, with a, another party that says it agrees to obtain insurance and get a waiver of subrogation on all their policies, and you look and, well, they never asked us for a waiver of subrogation endorsement. In order for subrogation waivers to be effective in most states, there has to be consent on the part of the insurer. That's you. You have to consent because it's your right they're waiving. They can't waive your right to subrogation. It's a contractual right set forth in your, your policy. Um, so we need to know the laws in, in each state with regard to when and whether uh, a subrogation waiver is effective, whether an exculpatory clause is effective. In most states, uh, the law will state that, no, you can't enter into a contract and have another party agree to hold you harmless and indemnify you even for your own sole negligence. In states that do allow partial indemnity, uh, most of the time that's held as against public policy and it's void. In, in some states, <clears throat> those exculpatory clauses um, have to be uh, conspicuous. They have to be in a certain type font or they have to be bold. They have to be set forth uh, so they're conspicuous in the contract so that they're easily seen because as we all know, we look at a contract, our eyes glaze over and we sign it. Well, that's what your insureds do too. Or it's on the back of a, of a, of a, a work order or an invoice or something and they make claim, well, look here, they, they agreed to hold us harmless. Uh, don't buy that. Don't, don't close the file just because you have an obstacle in the roadway because underneath that obstacle is that bag of gold and um, that rock in the road that you see is often an opportunity. But it does take work, and I hit this again, and I hope you remember, it is an investment. Um, one of the, 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 the ironies of my job is I see a lot of the people I work with, the claims handlers, the claims supervisors, they agree, hey, there's money potential here, hey, we want to pursue this. Um, but it's the people upstairs who maybe haven't worked in a subrogation capacity that sometimes put the kibosh on spending $3,000 on an expert in a case where you've paid out you know, $800,000. Uh, good money after bad, they say. Well, it might be, but more often than not, it isn't. If you put value into that case, some liability adjuster somewhere is going to be facing a claim where we have done our job right, and that creates subrogation potential. It creates settlement opportunities. So even in cases that don't have slam dunk liability facts, <clears throat> It's important that we realize that there is subrogation opportunity. One of the things we pride ourselves on, and I hope whoever you use for subrogation recoveries nationwide or throughout North America does this, our job is to tell you when you're chasing your tail. Our job is to tell you when you're stepping over dollars to pick up dimes, um, when you're wasting money or throwing good money after bad. Uh, and, and when we do that, it isn't because we don't want to handle your file. It's because I don't want to be three years from now answering questions about why did we spend $10,000 and we don't have anything to show for it. Um, we try to make assessments on subrogation potential based on our experience and our knowledge of the law, the latter of which we think is, is incomparable. I mean, we have a pretty high opinion of, of our experience and our knowledge of the law because I think that's the key to success. Training is the key to success. I, I give webinars like this to clients because the more you know, the, the, the more likely it is that you're going to catch an issue in a file that you're handling. And if you're not sure, send us a question through the subrogation question feature of our website. Um, refer a file to us through the refer a file feature, which allows you to update instantly and securely your file from your, 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 um, your own system 
and ask a question. Do you think we have potential here? Yes or no? Uh, you're not making a committal on, on pursuing it, but you, you, you want to get a second opinion. And if you get a no, then you can close that file. And you don't stand the chance that it's one of the five biggest files I talked about. <clears throat> Somebody closed those files, including one involving a power plant in Kansas City that was some $50 million. Somebody closed that file that had a lot of potential. That's a huge financial mistake that was made. And I think sometimes we look at subrogation as the red-haired stepchild. Um, and um, <clears throat> so we want to look at things as an investment. Uh, real quick here, uh, we have our trivia question winner. Um, and it's uh, Tammy Dickinson with Hastings Mutual. First of all, welcome Hastings. I know you have a lot of people uh, listening today, uh, and we appreciate that. Tammy gave the ter correct trivia answer, which is Alaska. It's the only state that you can type on your computer keyboard using only one row of keys. Uh, congratulations, Tammy. J uh, Jamie will get uh, information from you and find out when you want your cruise to, oh, wait, it's a book. Uh, you could, <laughs> uh, which are valuable. I don't know. I don't get the money for them. Uh, the publisher does. Uh, I think we make like 20 bucks a book. So that's uh, certainly not a profit center for us. But as I said, information, knowledge is key here. And we, we, we take the time to write the books and we give the seminars because the, the more educated you are, uh, <clears throat> the better the chances are that you're not going to make a huge mistake uh, and that you're going to pick up the pebbles that are necessary uh, to give yourself the opportunity for the sparkling flawless diamonds. And, and that, that does take a lot of work. And in some cases, it takes some finance, financial investment. It is an investment. And so um, hang on, I'm trying to change the uh, subrogation is an investment. Um, it has to be taken seriously. Uh, I just uh, I have a column in Claims Journal. Uh, and another one on the CLM magazine, and I think one of them just published an article recently. Um, if a tree falls in the woods, does the subrogation department hear it? Um, <clears throat> think about that. Unless you hear that tree falling, the tree may be falling on someone's house or it may fall on a car. Uh, the subrogation opportunity is there, but we have to recognize it. We have to tag large losses for additional investigation. I'll tell you that this is my rule of thumb, and you know instantly it's not true, but pretend it is. If you have a catastrophic loss, you have subrogation potential. In many ways, it is true because the simple sheer size of a claim will put the fear of God into potential tortfeasors, and uh, that translates into significant settlement potential. Um, <laughs> I'm not here to be an advocate for tort reform. I'm not here to tell you to file frivolous lawsuits. We don't do that. But what we do do is uh, we aggressively pursue uh, any and all subrogation potential, and we do not relent. Um, we are the most hated people at, at mediations because we are the ones being asked to compromise. And I'll be the first one to say, look, until the plaintiff's attorney cuts his fee in half, I am not cutting our interest by a penny. Um, that doesn't go over very well, uh, and, but, but it's effective. We strive to be cost effective and we'll always ask the question, who owns this loss? Um, uh, we should think subrogation. It is an extremely valuable uh, tool. It's the only, other than underwriting, it's the only source of income, uh, underwriting and investment, it's the only source of income into an insurance company. And sometimes I wonder why it's not given um, the appropriate uh, amount of respect and allocation of assets. Um, so help us turn it into something that, that, that insurance companies just realize is a must. We have to pursue it aggressively. Um, I do have some questions here that have come in. Uh, Jamie just brought me, wow, <clears throat> I hope this is because this is an introductory course and I had to skim some topics and not that I'm a bad presenter. Um, we have a lot of questions. I'm going to answer just a few of them here. Um, question from Erica in San Antonio. Question, we see a lot of property loss cases involving fires which start from vehicles parked in garages and next to insured buildings. Can we sue General Motors, for example, for a vehicle defect which causes a fire which spreads to the building? 
can we recover for the value of the car, question mark, its contents, question mark. Uh, Erica, that's a great question. We talked a little bit about the economic loss doctrine. I think we have some more webinars on it available on our website. This, of course, is a court-developed doctrine that has been adopted by the majority of U.S. states and jurisdictions. Uh, it, it's a rule which prohibits a tort recovery, negligence, strict tort liability. Remember, we talked about product liability. When a product defect or failure causes damage to itself, but that means it's causing only economic damage. I bought this product. product didn't work. Parentheses, it blew up. Uh, it didn't work the way it was supposed to, but it doesn't cause any personal damage, personal injury damage or damage to other property other than itself. So the economic loss doctrine says purchaser of a, of a product uh, can't, uh, can't recover from the manufacturer on a tort theory for damages to the product itself. Why? Uh, you know, I've struggled with this. I think the courts have tried to separate tort and contract law, and they say that if you buy a product, if I go to someone and say, I will give you $10 for that product, give me the product, and especially if there's a warranty involved, you are agreeing to a specific set of remedies, which don't include suing somebody every time a product doesn't live up to your expectations. So instead, they say that in order to recover uh, for damages resulting from a product defect, you have to have damages to, to products or to, to, to property other than the product. So in your example, uh, in most cases, you won't be able to recover for the, the, the value of the car itself. If there are contents of that car uh, that are damaged or destroyed, you should be able to recover those. You should be able to recover for a fire which spreads to a building or to a neighboring building um, as a result of the manufacturing defect or design defect of the vehicle. But um, you you will probably won't be able to recover just for the for the product itself. Um, <clears throat> uh, Lisa uh, Lisa with Zenith Insurance uh, asks, can an insurer be put on the list for a court ordered restitution? Lisa, I would direct you um, to the chart we have called subrogation of criminal restitution in all 50 states, um, and the answer is yes, and the answer is no. Um, uh, depending on what state you're in, some states define the insurer as a victim, uh, and some states say, hey, the insurance companies have so much money, and they don't need any more money, and they can never be a victim. A true victim is somebody who's really aggrieved, such as, uh, you know, you're, you're insured. And uh, so they don't let you uh, recover from this process. I, I don't know why that mindset exists. Um, there's a National Vaccine Act. I have a number of cases coming to us where somebody was vaccinated and uh, the shot uh, has struck a nerve or a bursa in the arm and caused permanent damage to an arm as a result of a vaccine. And unfortunately, there's this nice program set up that, that allows for recovery uh, from uh, providers of vaccines from a, a big uh, federal uh, trust fund. The only problem is it says, well, if you're an insurance company, you can't recover. Well, wait a second, we're the insurance company. We paid the person who had the damage. We're stepping into his shoes. Why not let us recover? Well, it just doesn't feel right to have taxpayer dollars go to re reimburse insurance companies. Well, I wish they'd rethink that because I, I, I think they're, they're really affecting the economy when they squelch subrogation. It's an easy thing to do, but in many cases, it's a coward's way out. I, so, Lisa, I guess the answer depends on the state that you're in. Um, I always assert... Um, restitution and then we always file the restitution order with the county recorder and we've had good luck because these people want these criminal uh, records expunged and until that restitution is paid for uh, oftentimes it can't be um, and and that's uh, that's great one one last question I know we're running a little over and then I'll, I'll let you guys go I appreciate uh, uh, your attending today um, question uh, Robert and Columbus, uh, Ohio, are insured rights to waive subrogation pre-loss different under different lines of insurance? Um, uh, yeah, yes, they are. I mean, most policies have a, a pre-loss waiver of subrogation, um, provided it's done pre-loss. Uh, you can see the waiver of subrogation actually involves two separate provisions. A waiver of subrogation clause contained 
in the contract, be it an AIA contract between a subcontractor and a contractor. And then it requires a provision in the policy or an endorsement to the policy which grants permission in, uh, for the, uh, to the insured to waive in writing recovery rights against others prior to loss. Um, <clears throat> I, you know what, I, I, I will respond to you uh, with uh, uh, an article that I wrote that I think is going to answer your question uh, pretty completely. It, it, it does vary from commercial general liability. I know there's an ISO commercial CGL form um, uh, 0001 and condition 8 affirms the carrier's legal right to subrogation and requires the insured to cooperate. And then there's uh, a provision in there about allowing the insured to waive recovery. And it's a little bit different with commercial auto, uh, commercial property in the inland marine. And it's certainly different in work comp. Um, if those of you who have our book, Workers' Compensation Subrogation in All 50 States, there's a chapter. Uh, it's called something like contractual limitations to subrogation. And that goes into the law in each state with regard to waivers of subrogation. Are they allowed? Some states, they just aren't. When are they allowed? Um, does the insurer have to consent? Well, how can the insured consent? Does it require a waiver? And even deeper than that, if you have a waiver of subrogation, are you waiving your right to uh, you know, a lien? Are you waiving your right to a future credit? These are all important considerations. Uh, are you waiving your right to reimbursement, even though you may be waiving your right to subrogate, i.e. step into the shoes of the insured and sue the bad guy? Are you waiving your right to reimbursement, which is set forth in your policy? So um, I, there are a few other questions here, uh, and I will uh, respond or have somebody respond to everybody with those questions. I want to thank you all for your attendance. Uh, this was a great turnout. And it's a great subject. Uh, we can never learn too much about this. And just uh, keep us in mind. If you have any questions, let us know. Our website is shown on the screen. Thank you, and have a great day. Bye-bye.